Cutting Edge Technology Track at the 18th International Space Development Conference. Uh, the speaker uh, at this time is Amy Ross. She's a spacesuit project engineer and the engineering director of the crew at the Thermal Systems Division for Extra Vehicular and Spacesuit Systems Branch at Johnson Space Center. Uh, Amy has worked there for a number of years and uh, besides working with EVA suits in general, she special specializes in the development of the gloves, a critical area of uh, work on the spacesuits. Uh, just as an aside, Amy comes from the uh, space family. She's the daughter of spacewalk record holder Jerry Ross, and her mother also works at Johnson Space Center. Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Ross. Thank you very much for having me this morning. If anybody in the back can't hear me, just let me know and I'll start using the mic for speaking louder. Um, thank you for having me. I enjoy, I really enjoy speaking about um, space and space suits. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about this morning. We spent about 10 minutes talking about spacesuit design, general aspects that need to be included in your thinking when you design a spacesuit. And then um, talk about some of the advanced testing that we're doing in space at the Johnson Space Center, and I'll leave some question, time for questions at the end. I'm going to talk kind of fast because I've got a lot of ground to cover, um, but stop me if you have any questions too in the middle here. First of all, what you see over here is the current spacesuit that we're using to um, fly the shuttle and build the space station. This is the shuttle EMU, or the extravehicular mobility unit, as we call it. And um, it's a good representation of the different parts and components of what are needed in a spacesuit. Okay, yeah, I need some hands. Help me think about what you have to think about when you design a spacesuit. What are critical factors in designing a spacesuit? Anybody know? I'm <laughs> Actually, that's real important. <laughs> I want it plaid the next time we design a spacesuit. Mobility. Mobility, that's what I deal with mostly. Uh, I am a soft goods engineer. I design the soft parts and mobility aspects of the spacesuit. I am not a life support engineer. You know. um, but that is a major aspect of spacesuit design, of course. So some of these factors are going to play in too. What's another aspect? Meteorite. Meteorite. Micrometeoroids and orbital debris. Not only are already some for the International Space Station, but also for little people outside calling around outside on the space station. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Okay. Thermal control. Thermal control, very true. Anybody who lives in Houston knows how important thermal comfort can be. Same thing when you're working in a spacesuit. Overall protection Yes, UV protection, radiation protection overall in general. Uh huh. What's another one? Communication. Communication, uh huh. That's part of the life support system function. Exactly, very important. As we, if any of you saw a little bit of the space um, walk last night, comp was not very good, and that's tells you how important it is when you don't have it. <laughs> Pardon? Durability. Durability, yes. Um, that's a factor in the International Space Station. We've had to make some modifications to the shuttle suit for that aspect because the suits are going to be up on the station for a longer period of time and lower maintenance intervals um, or wider space at maintenance interval intervals. Now when we go on to Mars, it's going to be more important. Any others? Pardon? Positional and torque control. Right. Positional and torque control, I can include that mobility aspects. And then voice management, of course, is an important one. I'll get that question, and I have a good answer for that one. <laughs> yes. Moisture. Moisture. Humidity control in the loop of the suit, yes. Well, if that's what you're speaking of. Okay. Um, so we can hit. How about more of a scratch your nose or take Well, I've got the drink of water covered. The scratch your nose, you got to get pretty. Uh, Inventive. <laughs> One of the first things that when people get into the spacesuit as a newbie, they get in the spacesuit, they're all excited, and you put the helmet on, and all of a sudden they go, doink! They're like, oh man! Because the minute you get into a spacesuit with a helmet on, you got to hit your nose. It's incredible. It's, it's always fun to go watch a new person get in the spacesuit because they're going to do it every time. Okay, so we've covered several of the main factors of spacesuit design. There's mobility, and then there's environmental factors like Thermal control, radiation, micrometeoroids, orbital debris, uh, comfort control. So I'm going to go through and tell you about how we address those issues with our spacesuit design. And one of the best ways to do that is take a look at the layout of the spacesuit. This is a, a layout of the spacesuit here. 
There are about 10 layers in a spacesuit, and each one of these layers has a function to serve to address each of these design considerations in the spacesuit. Now, the other layer is called orthofabric. Okay? It's actually three different materials. Its base material is Nomex, and Nomex is the material that firefighter spacesuits are made out of. Firefighter suits, excuse me, firefighter suits are made out of. Um, then it's got a gold weave. You can see that cross hatch pattern, the gold fibers in there. Those are Kevlar fibers. Kevlar is what bulletproof vests are made of. So it's tough, it acts as a ripstop in this material. So if you start to get a puncture or a tear, it's not going to just continue from propagating, it's going to stop it. Then it's coated in Teflon. Who knows what's a common use for Teflon? Skillets, exactly. No stick pans. And it's kind of the same idea here. Uh, it does a couple things for you. One, if you're running against something that's kind of jagged or sharp, it's the no slick, the slick Teflon's going to keep it from grabbing very well. Also, if you run into some nasty old monomethyl hydrazine or some kind of other rocket propulsion that might be coming out of an RCS thruster, this will help keep it from um, penetrating through the additional layers of spacesuit. So, and it's also highly resistant to attack and those kind of things. So, those are some of the reasons for the layers in that outside of the spacesuit, the golden fabric. It also is the first layer of micrometeoroid orbital debris protection. Okay, let's talk about orbital debris for a minute. This is a, a scenario that we don't like to think about very often, but we have to. You're trucking along in the space shuttle or out on the front face of station flapping in the breeze, and you're going 70,500 miles per hour, orbital velocity. This way. Out from outer space comes a little bitty, bitty back of something. Doesn't have to be big at all. We're talking millimeter sizes here, itty bitty. And it's coming at you 70,500 miles per hour this way. Okay, you meet in the middle at 35,000 miles per hour. Okay, this could be a bad day in space scenario. This is not good, because if you get a hold of your spacesuit, the options are not high to um, excellent success. You've got um, some problems to deal with. So what we try to do is protect you from those problems if you get a hold of your spacesuit. And the first, line, uh, first defense mechanism is this outer layer because it has to punch through this layer, which it's going to do if it actually hits you right. So when you hit, when, for micrometeoroid orbital debris shielding, when they first started thinking about it, they thought, well, we need these big, thick panels on the outside so that if anything tries to get through, it's going to be like a suit of armor and you're not going to penetrate. Well, the physics involved in micrometeoroid and orbital debris at those kind of um, velocities is different than ballistic velocities. So instead of having something big and thick, um, you want to have lots of thin layers. When you hit something big and thick with particles at that speed, what happens is the energy just propagates right through and it blows this big hole out on the back side. And so you probably have more damage than if you've not had anything in between you. Because otherwise it might just kind of clean through. But it kind of magnifies the effect. Now if you have several little thin layers separated by small distances, what happens is that little particle has to hit one and then it kind of slows down and breaks up. Hits the next one, it slows down even more, it breaks up even more. So you get this big scatter pattern, so it looks like a lot of damage, but by the time it gets to layers that you really care about protecting, it's really slow and it's really spread out, so it's not going to penetrate into the inner layers or your air containment layers. So what we have next is several of those kind of layers. This is it actually is twofold. It's twofold. It does a micrometeoroid and orbital debris function, but then it also is part of your thermal protection. This is called luminized mylar. We call it MLI, multiple layer insulation. And it's just uh, like aluminum foil already thinner and several layers of it reinforced by a skim material, scrim material. And there are five layers of that. So something goes through the orthofabric and then it's got to get through each one of these little layers. This insulation really only works in a vacuum space. So when we go to Mars, we have to come up with new kinds of insulation. Although Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere, just one hundredth of Mars does have enough that the MLI will short circuit and won't insulate. Okay, now this is your last ditch protection in your micrometeoroid orbital debris problem. This is a liner. It's basically a neoprene cream coated nylon, and it's a kind of heavier fabric so that hopefully when it hits here, it's just going to be that wide spread pattern and not <coughs> going to penetrate through. 
because the next two layers are really important. The next two layers are what really make the spacesuit. This is a restraint material, and I'll talk about that, but it's a material that actually forms the mobility of the suit. Okay, this is a glove, and the glove has, just like the rest of the spacesuit, a bladder and a restraint. The restraint is where all the mobility, the pleat, the gimbal rings, the swivels, that kind of thing are built in into the spacesuit. Okay, so you want to protect that because that layer is holding in the pressure of the spacesuit. It's the um, outer, obviously, yeah, you, you know, it's like you blow up a balloon, but you don't want the balloon to be stressed, so you put a smaller fabric sheath around it. So that's what's carrying the stress in your suit. And so that's a structural component. You don't want to give it damage to that. Then there's the bottom of the suit. This is your air retention layer. This is really important to you. This is what keeps you alive. Um, the spacesuit is just basically a big human-shaped balloon, and this is the balloon layer. And it's just a coated material as well. And then these internal layers here are your liquid cooling and ventilation garment, which we'll talk about some more. But those are the layers of the spacesuit. Um, radiation protection is mainly just provided by the layers of the spacesuit. Astronauts do have, you know, just like uh, I think it's OSHA, that puts out the requirements on how much radiation you can take in a year of a lifetime. And so they track uh, astronauts' intake of radiation, uh, internal and external, to the, sp the space vehicle. So they have little disometers they wear when they go outside. Uh, that's, so we don't have real strong radiation protection as of yet. Like when we do the trans-Mars kind of walks, then we're going to have to really um, get smarter on how we do protect the, the folks from radiation. Now for the UV, for your eyes, we have coatings in the visor that take care of that. It's just like sunglasses on a really bright day. We have that kind of thing in the helmet visor. Okay. Let's see. Now let's talk about the different parts of the spacesuit and what they do. Uh, when you get dressed in a spacesuit, one of the first things you do is when you put on your regular old uh, comfy underwear, and then you're going to put on a special kind of underwear. And we talked about the thermal aspects of doing a spacewalk. Spacewalk is hard work. Uh, I have had op my opportunity to get to the neutral buoyancy laboratory myself several times. It's a big swimming pool that they practice the spacewalks in. And uh, I consider myself to be in fairly decent shape, but that is hard work. And you can really build up a sweat inside of a spacesuit. So when you're outside, you don't want to be too concerned about your thermal comfort. So what you wear is this garment. It's called the liquid cooling and ventilation garment. You can see it's basically a big pair of long johns. You zip them up. You can see all the tubes running through the garment, all over the torso and arms and legs. Those are little water tubes. Now what happens? Sure. What happens is this is connected to your life support system. There's a tube that comes around into the inside of the part of the torso, and it connects to this garment here, and then cold water comes flowing in one of these pockets well, and it runs through the suit. The cold water cools you down and picks up the heat from your body and then the water comes back out this end and is taken back to your life support system where it uh, goes through a sublimator and that's how they, they cool it down. Again, that's another technology that we're going to have to rethink when we go to Mars because the sublimator needs back into work and we won't have that on Mars. Now the middle one is uh, ventilation. They flow Actually, it sucks air up. You see the tubes go down the arms and down the legs. Um, they used to try to air condition spacesuits, but there's just not enough volume, and air doesn't have enough heat carrying capacity to um, do that job by itself. So what we could basically do now is just try to keep the air fresh inside the spacesuit. You know, people tend to off gas, and so we just <laughs> suck up the air from the extremities and then put it through a filtering system that cleans up. So that's the purpose of this garment here. Air comes in, this is, you know, this is just an outlet here. So air comes in through, you can see the helmet has this big white mid pad. What that is is the air coming over the oral nasal cavity. So that's where the fresh air comes in. So you get the freshest air where you need it first. And then you suck up the dirty air from the extremities. Now another aspect of this LCPG, I'm glad they have them on this show and tell item, is you see these pads? Okay, we've got them on the shoulders here and the knees here. We've got pads for any part of your body you can think of. Rib pads and back of the knee pads and elbow pads. 
Um, wearing a spacesuit is not a very comfortable thing yet, and we're still working on that. Um, anytime your soft, squishy tissue is up against a hard surface and rubs there continuously for several hours, you're going to feel some discomfort at the least. And so we try to minimize that by patting those places where you might experience the most uh, frequent discomfort. I always come out with bruises on my elbows even though I wear elbow pads. So it's just how your body, the way you move a spacesuit is that your body has to react against the spacesuit. And there tends to be places where you do that more frequently than others, and so you need to kind of protect those places, otherwise you'll end up with contusions. Thank you. Two minutes left. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. You then we'll have a five-minute question. Okay. Okay, I brought a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm not going to get to talk about all of it. But, um, so we talked about the design of spacesuit and what you have to think about. Now, let me talk just a little bit about the advanced spacesuit stuff. Um, I'm, like I said, primarily concerned about advanced spacesuit design. Uh, you can see spacesuit weights here, because they're comparative weights. Um, when you go to Mars, yeah, it's going to be one third the gravity, but you're going to be going out and doing geology and uh, continuous work. So it's like a backpacker. You need to have the lightest pack you can find. Backpackers spend a lot of money to get itty bitty light sleeping bags and canteens and that kind of thing. Or we're going to want to have the same kind of mental philosophy there. A portable life support system, or primary life support system, depending on what area you came from. Um, now, the mobility is different in a terrestrial suit than a zero G suit, and that's pretty obvious. Uh, zero G, you get no foot restraint, you stay there, and you do everything with your upper body. Now, when you go on to Mars, that's not true. The primary thing you're going to be going to Mars for is to do geology in the first wave of um, exp exploration. Now, the moon suit, this is the A7LB, the Apollo suit, that you see in the picture over there. Um, it was built for planetary surface use. It was, it was built for planetary surface use. So it did have walking capability, but it was a, a short little weekend camping trip. It wasn't like going to Antarctica for months on end. So when you go to, to places like that, and the space suit there is going to have to be very different. It's going to need to be very mobile much more mobile than any suits we've had in the past, more like your body's own mobility capabilities. So this is um, the Mars 3 spacesuit. It was developed at Johnson Space Center, and it's one of our advanced spacesuits. You can see the mobility comparison here. Um, kneeling is going to be very important. <laughs> um, we have a geologist we work with, and he constantly, when he gets to a new field site, walks around with his face in, toward the ground and kneels down and picks up rocks to look at them. That's what he does. That's how you do field exploration and geology, field site survey. And so you can see here in these two suits, Willie in the Paul suit there, that's as close as he can get to the ground. He cannot bend over and pick a rock up. Uh, whereas you can see Dom, another suit subject, in the Mark III, he's able to bend over and pick something up off the floor. Willie to pick something up, what he had to do, and he could only do this in lunar gravity, not Mars gravity. This is not the KC-135, the vomit coming. Um, he, to pick something up, he actually fell on it <laughs> and then recovered. <laughs> and if, if you go back and watch some Apollo footage, you'll see that they, that's basically how they were just always on the verge of falling over. And sometimes they did. Uh, you can see this is the recovery. If you fall down, it's no, I fell down and I can't get up. And you're, you fell down and you're umpteen million miles from home, you got to get up yourself. So you need the mobility to get up. And this just kind of demonstrates <laughs> the extreme mobility that we have in some of the advanced suits that we're using today for testing. We have three advanced suits. This was Mars gravity, by the way. That makes it even more impressive. Um, so we've got three advanced suits that we're going to start on Monday doing some, advanced, some testing of where we look at the different ranges of motion of the different joints. So that way we can pick and choose what technologies we want to hold into the next generation of spaces. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm looking ahead to the day when we might start exploring worlds other than the moon or Mars and what their spacesuits for them might be like. Uh, you know, like maybe a planet that is Earth-like except the atmosphere is chlorine, or we might have a planet that's uh, got a solid surface, but two or three times the pull of gravity, and uh, I imagine that'll be the age of interstellar flight, of course, 
they always talk about what's going to be to get there, but I'm thinking in terms of how we're going to explore those planets once our we get there and what types of spacesuits and manipulators and handle rocks and so forth. We've done some brainstorming at Johnson Space Center and uh, we're just off, I mean, really brainstorming, spray on spacesuits. Really? They're comfy, they're quick to get on, all those kind of things. You want, you want something that's as low impact operationally as you possibly can. Um, the Mark III spacesuit, which I showed you pictures of, what that, oh, that's actually this suit here, was developed to be a zero pre-breathe suit. All right now on the shuttle they have to reduce the cabin pressure and then three week two hours and then go out the door. Well, this suit would have allowed them to jump in a suit and go out the door, no pre breathe. Um, so those are the kind of things that we'll, we'll have to continue thinking about into the future. Okay, he's asking about self donning capability. Actually, the Mark III uh, does have self donning capability. The Orlon suit, the Russian suit, is self donnable. Um, the current EMU, supposedly, the design requirement said it would be self donnable, and if you're really good, you can, um, but most folks <laughs> can't do that. tend to include that as a, as a requirement. It also um, helps because then you don't have to have a third crew member involved in the EBA process taking up their time as well. So it's just operationally smart. <laughs> well, right now there's only two EMUs that fly at a time that are able to go outside. And most How long does it take to put on This one actually doesn't take long to put on at all. It takes 10 minutes, maybe. Truly. That's with help. Yeah, you normally have two technicians <laughs> helping you do this. It all depends on the emergency scenario. Yeah. But you'd like it to be five minutes. We've been talking about five minutes or less. But just get just think about how long it takes you to just put your clothes on in the morning. It just takes a little while for people to get in inside of garments. Yeah. Uh, that that one you just talked about, that's a semi-hurt suit with those rings that rotate. How the, the heat, how the string rotate, rotate and the gas still stays inside. Right. Um, he's talking about bearings. He's asking about how do we keep bearing surfaces sealed. We kind of use static seals in a dynamic manner, <laughs> is what we do. Um, there are bearings all throughout this suit as well as the suit up there. That's the Mark III. This is the EMU. And there are bearings, soft goods, when you pressurize soft goods, they're really like a pressure vessel. They're a hard component. This looks all nice and soft and squishy here, but put the 4.3 psi that's operating pressure in the space unit, and it's hard. It's like a drum. And so when you try to build rotating joints in spacesuits in soft goods, it gets difficult. So we include hard components like bearings in different areas of the suit, like the waist bearing. This is the waist bearing here, and there's an upper arm bearing and um, the shoulder bearing in the EMU. And that suit is just chock full of bearings. Um, we, like I said, we use basically static seals in a dynamic manner, and it has worked so far. We have to be very careful in our design and the materials we pick and make sure there's a compression set. Well, uh, what PSI, minimum PSI, do you not have to that? It depends on your cabin pressure. It depends on what you're used to. If you go from a 14.7 environment, which is sea level atmosphere, then it's 8 PSI per the current charts we're using now, which are fairly conservative. And those are associated with bids concerns and that kind of thing. Um, from a 10 point, uh, what is it, 10 plot, 10 four cabin, uh, it, it goes down quite a bit. Um, let's see, we're talking about 3.75 PSI for advanced space suits on Mars. And I think that is a minimal preview, 30 minutes to an hour. Last question. Okay. How does the Mark III compare to uh, Victor Cal's uh, Okay. Um, the Mark III was developed at Johnson Space Center, and it's a, a hybrid suit, which means it has hard components, like a hard upper torso, like the shuttle suit has, and it's got soft components too, in, like here. The AX5, which was developed at Ames Research Center, was an all hard suit, all hard components, composites and metals and bearings and all that, even the gloves. Um, in mobility, the X5 has a wider range of mobility, and the torque in that mobility is very low. In fact, the suit has more mobility than people have. The elbows can go backwards, which you don't do in perfect 
Congress. Um, <laughs> watch, watch enough, Jackie Chan movie or something. Um, but they did a test when they were trying to decide if they were going to use the EMU or use the X-5 or Mark III for the space station suit. And they compared the suits, and what they did was they asked the astronauts not only um, they asked astronauts subjective comments as well as taking objective data on range of motion and torque. And although some aspects of the AS5, like the shoulder, was preferred um, because of its mobility and range of motion, the astronauts still preferred the soft elbows, like in the, AX, the Mark III and the EMU, for comfort reasons. And it just gets a point where you can't move that far anyway. Why do you need that mobility? And there's some parts of the suit where you just have the muscle mass that you can overcome the torque, a little bit higher torque, and still not get overly fatigued. So um, in advanced suit design, we don't say that suit's bad, this suit's bad, or good. We say, this. I like this aspect, I like that aspect, and we can incorporate this idea and maybe change it this way. That's, that's you know, our idea. So there are several ideas from the main slide we're still exploring. Ladies and gentlemen.
actually didn't make money. Now that I'm looking at it like one a chapter meeting, and I'm like, damn, shit, it's pretty valuable. So I just love this. You know, I mean, uh, we lucked out with the reason. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we lucked out. We got a, uh, last year, we got a,